So without further ado, I'd like to introduce David Wood. Thank you. Well, thank you, Ron, and, and thank you, uh, Christine. Um, and thank you for coming back again. Uh, the, the big idea behind thinking out of the box was that my academic colleagues at Vanderbilt are not all eggheads ensconced deep in the library stacks working on further refinements of increasingly useless knowledge, but <laughs> at least in some cases, people challenging our dominant ways of thinking, resisting the seductive mantras of the marketplace, opening up other ways of moving forward. Those who were truly thinking out of the box deserved a wider audience than their colleagues and students, so we brought them down to this market square, our downtown library. And over the past few years, as the press has shrunk and the media consolidated, the hunger for new ideas has only grown. On many fronts, political, environmental, international relations, it's increasingly clear, and people are saying it out loud, we can't go on like this. Now, some of the speakers we've needed, we brought up needed coaxing into the sunlight. But that's not true of today's guest, <laughs> um, Bob Barsky, who's not only himself a public intellectual, but who's thought long and hard about what this means, the responsibilities, the opportunities, and the risks that it brings with it. Bob is a Canadian with a PhD from McGill, and at Vanderbilt he is a whole long list of things. He's professor of English, comparative literature, French, and Jewish studies. And if there were room on his sign, he could add linguistics, political science, philosophy, cultural studies, and so on. Bob is a true polymath whose work cuts across and floods across all these disciplines, knitted together, I think, by political and intellectual passion, probably for some pretty traditional virtues like uh, truth and justice. Among his many accomplishments, he's editor of AmeriQuest, a journal that discusses issues of migration, settlement, and multiculturalism right throughout the Americas. Now, sometimes it's interesting to ask how people have come to have the interest and the sensibilities they have, and I stumbled across uh, Bob's own description of his background, and it went something like this. An Anglophone Montrealer of immigrant parents, Irish, English, Austrian, mostly, Protestant on one side, via Hudson Bay in Saskatchewan, and Russian, Ukrainian, Jewish Orthodox via Winnipeg, Manitoba, on the other. <laughs> With, as he says, my parents virtually disowned by both sides, and therefore married in New York City by the Jewish anti-Bolshevik Marxist relatives on my father's side. <laughs> I love that. I have to say, I feel culturally de deprived when I read this. <laughs> We, we English have much duller plumage. Bob's not only an extraordinary po polymath, and by the way, a much-loved teacher, he's also a highly successful, sometimes celebrity author. He won considerable acclaim through his 1997 biography, Noam Chomsky, A Life of Dissent, translated into at least nine languages. He's written and edited many other books, and this month he's come out with a wonderful volume from MIT Press, and here it is. Uh, here are some of the first to see it. It's called The Chomsky Effect, A Radical Works Beyond the Ivory Tower, which will, I'm sure, have him back on the international book tour circuit. So you have to, is it out? It's not quite out yet. It's out, coming out this month. You need to buy it. And his book on Zelig Harris, Zelig's America, Linguistics, Radical Politics, and Zionism in the 20th Century will be out next year. Chomsky radicalizes people who hear him, strongly for and strongly against. His allergic reaction to sporting events does not help. <laughs> but there's no doubting his status as one of the world's most influential public intellectuals. Bob Barsky is not only a public intellectual in his own right, he's also been a close confidant and collaborator of Chomsky for many years. And I look forward to his reflections on how Chomsky understands his role. Now, in composing this introduction, I only wish I could have found the opportunity to tell you more about this, this wild and crazy guy, Bob Barsky, his passion for scuba diving, his brushes with authority, his powerful Italian Moto Guzzi motorcycle, and so on, but I couldn't fit it in. Um, 
So please welcome Bob Bosky. Goodness. Um, thank you so much. Thank you for having me. And the number of people here is testament to a, a whole lot of things I want to talk about today. Um, all of you out beyond the ivory tower. Uh, and maybe paradoxically, I'm here to talk to you about um, working beyond the ivory tower, um, even as I, in some ways, represent it. Um, and I reflected before coming here upon why it is that this may have come to be a subject of interest to me and why it was that Chomsky became such an important interlocutor for me. And it actually, I think, dates back to my having been a newspaper uh, delivery boy um, in Montreal. I was very young. Um, I think I started doing this when I was about eight or nine. And I used to carry and slog hundreds of newspapers on my back um, through the mountains of snow and uh, across the fields of ice uh, that characterize uh, the world from which I come. And I developed, for some reason or another, an addiction to newspapers, uh, reading them from cover to cover uh, constantly. And it happened that while I was um, suffering from this addiction, I, I'm now almost incapable of reading them because they make me cry. Um, <laughs> I, the the Iran-Iraq war uh, was raging on, and it struck me, I guess at some point, I can't remember how old I was, that every day there was another explanation as to why it was we were joining the other side that we were on uh, today that we hadn't been on yesterday. Um, and I remember as a child having difficulty figuring out who, whose team I was supposed to be on. Uh, whether it was Iran or Iraq. Um, and it seemed, at least according to my memories, my frozen memories of that period, um, that, th that the answer to that question varied somewhat uh, from day to day. This may have begun in my own mind some sort of a problem with the idea of, in of experts telling me uh, what to think about and what to think. This got worse um, totally by accident. When I started working in a factory uh, loading aluminum siding, and because it was such a depressing and horrible job, I started buying silver um, rather than keeping my paycheck in the bank. And I don't know if you recall this, but Bunker Hunt decided to buy all the world's silver uh, at that particular moment. And I made a ton of money um, for, I mean, for a young guy. I can't remember, it was probably five or $6,000, but I'd, I didn't know what to do with it. It was like I was a millionaire. And I decided that this was easy and fun, so I decided to go into the, spot, into the stock market. Um, as a 15 or 16 year old guy. And there again, I was, I think, after a while, entranced by the fact that on Monday the stocks went up because employment figures were out suggesting that unemployment was down. And on Tuesday the stocks went down because employment figures were out suggesting that employment was up. Um, and every single day this kind of went on. Uh, and and today, to this day, it's actually one of the perverse pleasures I have every day is reading why the stock market did what it did. Um, it's, it's, um, it's my form of madness. <clears throat> so I think that these things led me to an interest in wondering about the experts who try and tell us what, uh, what to do and how to do it and what to think. And it made me realize that for each of these areas, whether it be the stock market or whether it be to figure out whose team we're on, we rely on experts as we do with, say, the next Titans game. Interestingly, though, we're more likely to question the experts about sports than we are to question the experts about, say, foreign policy or stock market investment, even though, in my opinion, we should, and by the way, could, because we know from the monkeys with dartboard tests that we know as much about market trends as any of the so-called experts. And we sure as heck know more about Mideast politics than those who have gone in and uh, done, wreaked havoc uh, of late. So one of the problems, in my opinion, is that we ask experts questions which are unanswerable. And that's going to be my, my first hypothesis. One of the big problems that we have in the world is that we are faced with this very perverse and weird existence on this planet. And we would like to believe that somebody out there can explain it. Um, and as it turns out, it's mostly, it mostly falls to the social scientists to do so. I think that if I'm to ask about the best oil to prevent wear on, my, on the cylinders of my motorcycle, there is an answer to that question. And I think that experts uh, do know it. But if I ask what Saddam Hussein was thinking when he invaded Kuwait, or whether the Google stock is going to contribute to rise, 
or if the court is going to find O.J. Simpson guilty, or how many angels dance on the head of a pin, I'm asking an unanswerable question. I ask them of experts, perhaps, in the hope that I really can come to believe in something, some kind of transcendent knowledge. But that really is wishful thinking. And it just leads to either a lot of hot air, or worse, it leads me to want to try and elevate people to a level where they have no right to be. That is, justifying what is wrong to a population desperate to believe in authority and power, if only to hope that it doesn't land up bringing them to nuclear disaster. So my question then is, is there a role for experts in realms beyond, say, technical matters in terms of, say, fixing my motorcycle? In other words, what can intellectuals do? They have a lot of time on their hands, and they have a certain degree of expertise, and so they can, to cite Chomsky, tell the truth. He wrote in one of his earliest published works in the New York Review of Books, quote, it is the intellectual's responsibility to tell the truth, and I might add, and to do so without regard for personal advancement or fear of repercussion from authority or from power. There are lots of examples of this in Chomsky's work, lots of examples of how he tries to tell the truth. For example, in a discussion about a White House public statement concerning the multilateral agreement on investment, which by the way was kept secret from everyone in the public, and according to Chomsky, also from uh, the Congress, Chomsky says the following. So we can carry out a little exercise in logic. Domestic constituencies were apparently informed of the multilateral agreement. So who are domestic constituencies? It plainly wasn't Congress. In fact, Congress wasn't even informed. So 25 representatives wrote a letter to the White House asking, how come you've been negotiating this agreement for three years and you haven't told us about it? According to the Constitution, international commerce is the province of the Congress. Well, the people from Congress, says Chomsky, got a kind of letter back that you write, that you get if you write to them. A kind of letter saying, the, the kind of, that, that reads something like, Dear David, thank you for your interesting comments. <laughs> the letter was probably written, he says, by a computer. That's the kind of letter that Congress got back. So Congress wasn't a constituency. The public plainly wasn't a constituency. In fact, it was a kind of negative constituency. The idea was to keep them out of it, to keep them off our back. So the public is not a constituency. Congress is not a constituency. But the U.S. Council for International Business is. They were informed all the way, and they were intimately involved. The corporate sector, in other words, was involved. The White House is telling us plainly and clearly who their domestic constituencies are. It's very rare that political leaders are so frank in such a clear and vulgar fashion about exactly the way, they, the way that they perceive the world, says Chomsky. It's an accurate perception. But that's not what you're supposed to teach eighth grade civics or graduate courses in political science. I think the media were smart enough to keep it quiet and suppress it. Maybe, says Chomsky, somebody might think that through. This, it seems to me, is not only brazen and straightforward by most standards, but it's also very funny. And I notice the uproarious laughter. Uh, I, I'm one of the few people who finds Chomsky unimaginably funny. And I'll tell you, the last chapter in my new book is, is about humor. And it was just inspired by the unimaginable humor of this stuff. So I want to ask you, why were you laughing so hard? Why was this so unimaginably funny? And a related question, why was this an effective way of representing the facts concerning this multilateral agreement? One of Chomsky's tactics in presenting domestic policy to the US public is his use of plain language. It actually recalls a little bit what we read in George Orwell. And also his unexpected juxtapositions, for instance, the idea that domestic constituencies is everyone other than the domestic population. Or that what was demonstrated in the example is not which one, what one is supposed to teach either high school kids or political science students because it is, quote, just the truth. Here we see Chomsky's soft-spoken anti-theatrics, his sarcasm, his irony, which, in my opinion, are very effective, as is his ability to mimic the various voices of those party to the event, including the Dear David computer that writes letters to members of Congress from the White House. These kinds of revelations lead audience members who are present in Chomsky crowds to grin, to shake or nod their heads, or to quite literally burst out laughing, a kind of laughter that's as dark as it is enlightening. This is the force of humor that Chomsky uses, 
And moreover, this is the power that I think humor has. And that's going to be my second point, is that one of the most effective forms of political engagement and one of the most powerful ways to get at the truth is through humor. The clown, like Noam Chomsky or David Letterman, can say anything, including the truth, and can get away with it. The humbled outsider, like Woody Allen, can pour his wretched self into the script, and we can find both pity and self-realization in his words. We all know about laughter. We all laugh, and we all use humor in some way or another. But it's rare for us to think about the effects and the role that humor plays, the way it can, quite literally, bring things down to earth so that we can truly examine them in their material, naked, and sometimes pitiful forms. Chomsky also gives us license to laugh. And here is my first suggestion as to what so-called intellectuals can do. They can give us license. This I take to be a crucial role, to hear from somebody with authority that we can laugh, that we should laugh, particularly when we're in the face of nonsense or bullshit. Let me quote Chomsky again. In the 1970s, there was a lot of concern that incompetent management meant the United States was falling behind the Japanese, particularly, and also the Europeans. It wasn't developing flexible manufacturing techniques. They were way behind because of management failures. What happened? The Pentagon stepped into the breach. It understands its place. It started a program called Manufacturing Technology, ManTech. It was a program to design what they called the factory of the future with integrated production, computer control of equipment, flexible technology, and so forth. That was then greatly expanded in the Reagan years because the Reaganites were extreme statists. They were strongly opposed to the market and market principles, more so than the norm. It was finally handed over to private industry. So there it is, American rugged individualism and consumer choice in the market as compared with the failure of state-managed East Asian systems. The whole discussion from one end to the other has been a tissue of fabrications. It's not a simple story, and if you look at it closely, there are all sorts of complexities. But if that picture had been written in Pravda, people would have laughed. That's Chomsky. This double image, us realizing that we had thought of Reagan as supporting free markets when in fact it was the mirror opposite, is given an extra helping of humor with the idea that those who read Pravda in the Eastern Bloc countries would never have been so gullible as we in the free world are. These moments in Chomsky's writings are quite literally spaces in which one is compelled to true belly laughter, or fury, I might add, in which we watch ourselves laughing at ourselves. In another example, describing how the Reaganites instilled fear into the population to carry on their misdeeds with impunity, Chomsky writes, Nicaragua was two days marching time from Texas, a dagger pointed at the heart of Texas, to borrow Hitler's phrase. Again, you'd think that people would have collapsed with laughter, but they didn't. That was continuously brought up to frightness. Nicaragua might conquer us on its way to conquering the whole hemisphere. <laughs> a national emergency was called because of the threat posed to national security by Nicaragua. Libyan hitmen were wandering the streets of Washington trying to assassinate our leader. Hispanic narco-terrorists were all over the streets. One thing after the other was conjured up to keep the population in a state of constant fear while they carried out their major terrorist wars. So for Chomsky, the fact that the population wasn't doubled over in hysterics was that laughter is not really permitted in that realm, quite literally. And this particular administration, a particularly humorous bunch, I must say, <laughs> seems to enforce not just the tough guy, I'm going to shoot you in the face if you get in my way of hunting quails image, but the closed, devout, quiet image as well, giving the impression that the interior of the White House resembles a mausoleum, even as the Pentagon plans thunderous performances of blazing firebombs to shock and to awe. Indeed, it seems to me, when there is no laughter, we ought to start worrying. And in the words of the philosopher of language, Mikhail Bakhtin, who lived in a very unpleasant moment under Stalin, who speaks of such issues from an historical perspective, quote, and here he's talking about the Middle Ages. Laughter, says Mikhail Bakhtin, in the Middle Ages, remained outside of all official spheres of ideology and outside of all official strict forms of social relations. Laughter was eliminated from rel religious cult, from feudal and state ceremonies, etiquette, and from all genres of high speculation. 
An intolerant, one-sided tone of seriousness is characteristic of official medieval culture. The very contents of medieval ideology, asceticism, somber providentialism, sin, atonement, suffering, as well as the character of the feudal regime with its oppression and its intimidation, all of these elements determine this tone of icy, petrified seriousness. It was supposedly the only tone fit to express the true, the good, and all that was essential and meaningful. Fear, religious awe, humility. These were the overtones of this seriousness, says Bertin. Intellectuals, as you know, are often guided by this same somber etiquette, as though speaking with big words in hushed tones should evoke appropriate reverence rather than, from my perspective, the serious engagement that comes with grounded interaction that is often reflected in things like laughter. So what I'm suggesting here is that when we laugh at statements which we might otherwise take very seriously, such as the idea that the Reagan government was supporting free markets, as in Chomsky's example, or we need to have a war in a country that, uh, in order to have peace, as we're now hearing, or we need to destroy a city in order to save it, as we heard during the Vietnam War, or we need to precisely calculate how much weaponry we need to construct to engage in a tactical nuclear battle, as we heard during the Cold War, we don't have to resort to the degrading and sometimes dehumanizing tactic of accepting preposterous proposals for terms for a debate before cons considering the fundamental issues at stake. Or when we support cutting social assistance or reducing public spending because we don't believe in big government, even though half a trillion dollars or so of our own money is spent on the military, on machines and actions that are supported with nary an audit or a control, except years later. So rather than debating the building of one nuclear-powered trillion-dollar battleship rather than another, we might simply think about laughing at how preposterous the whole discussion is before we even engage it. Laughter is, from this standpoint, creative, in part because it first allows us to destroy the artifice that is being presented to us, often by a figure of authority. So here is a positive role for the intellectual working beyond the ivory tower, to state the obvious, and to state it in a way that is honest and clear, and to state the obvious humorously, or maybe charismatically, in order to break through the nonsense, the unquestioned assumptions, and the undue deference. I think we all need it. I think we all want it. And I think that's why we like late night TV so much. Discussions of current events from the surreal perspective by the likes of J David Letterman. Nobody who has been paying even the least amount of attention to the news out of the Middle East for the last, say, 75 years could possibly have imagined that the Iraq war was winnable in the terms that we had heard. Indeed, nobody who followed as I did as a kid uh, could have thought that the Iran-Iraq war could have imagined whose side we'd even be on. But intellectuals from political sciences, economics, strategic studies are called upon all the time to explain to us that which seems to us counterintuitive and by doing so tries to legitimize what we would think to be illogical or foolhardy. I think that this is a very nefarious role played by so-called intellectuals because when they are engaged in public debates in this fashion, they come to be complicit. They are using their credentials, the PhD on some highly technical point that is debated in a circle of a few dozen people to tell us why power is right, even if it clearly isn't, or certainly not on the grounds that it says it is. I think it's a lot more fun and a lot more dangerous to use credentials, say a PhD or fancy name attached to one's normal name, to say the unsayable, to say what is true. But it's dangerous. And here's a conversation with Chomsky. A man in the audience says, Sir, you've been called a neo-Nazi. Your books have been burned. You've been called anti-Israel. Don't you get a bit upset by the way your views are always distorted by the media and by other intellectuals? Chomsky says, no. Why should I? I get called anything. I'm accused of everything you can dream of. Being a communist propagandist, a Nazi propagandist, a palm of freedom of speech, an anti-Semite, a liar, whatever you want. Actually, I think it's a good sign. I mean, if you're a dissident, you're typically ignored. If you can't be ignored and you can't be answered, then you're vilified. That's obvious. No institution is going to help people undermine it. So I would only regard the kinds of things you're talking about as signs of progress. Inciting Chomsky or other, in, or other dissidents in this fashion, 
I'm also suggesting that the public intellectual is valuable when she or he plays the role of the fool or the outsider. In this respect, they have people to emulate, notably the clowns in Shakespeare, those strange folks who, protected by the normal repercussions of their blasphemous or treasonous words by tradition, were able to tell the king when he's being an imbecile, a murderer, or a tyrant. We also have the likes of Emile Zola, or I might add Charles Dickens, who dared to take on power, as Zola did during the Dreyfus Affair, and despite or perhaps because of that personal risk, Zola is not only remembered as a great novelist, but also as a great and responsible human being. Or Marquis de Sade, who dared utter in print some of the thoughts and moreover some of the questions that we have about what it means to be human, to be tied to these strange, bizarre, desiring bodies. All of these writers are provocative. Some of these writers are funny. And many of them took personal risks to tell it the way it is, or at least the way they saw it. But in the end, I don't think that we need these catalysts. If the intellectual is going to play a role, then it should be the role of a catalyst, somebody to catalyze your own excitement, your own laughter, your own power, your own beliefs. I think that we need to be ourselves. I think that the role of an intellectual the role of an academic, the role of somebody with privilege or power should be to give power to the individual. In Henry Miller's great novel, Sexus, the narrator, an aspiring writer who has just read over a few passages of his own brilliance, writes, quote, every day we slaughter our finest impulses. That is why we get a heartache when we read those lines written by the hand of a master and recognize them to be our own. As the tender shoots which we stifled because we lacked the faith to believe in our own powers, our own criterion of truth and of beauty. Every man, when he gets quiet, when he becomes desperately honest with himself, is capable of uttering profound truth. We are all derived from the same source. There is no mystery about the origins of things. We're all part of creation. We're all kings. We're all poets. We're all musicians. We have only to open up, only to discover what is already there. What happened to me in my writing was tantamount to revelation. It was revealed to me that I could say what I wanted to say if I thought of nothing else, if I concentrated upon that exclusively and if I was willing to bear the consequence that a pure act always involves. Thank you. sort of obvious question if you think about the um, importance you're giving to laughter and humor uh, is whether that can also uh, be uh, a way in which real dissent gets diffused um, and I, you know one, I remember one of the um, uh, remarks you made you talked about a, a belly laugh or fury and I'm wondering if, in fact, you know, the belly laugh could actually uh, dissolve the fury, and, um, and and hence whether laughter and humor could be a way in which um, the need for a really radical transformation gets sort of sidetracked uh, into um, a sort of personal response. Mm. Do, do, do you think there's a problem there? Yeah. Do, do you think we need to sort of make, I'm sorry, I'm just make laughter and, and humor into part of a, a sort of package of responses. Oh, definitely. You know, I, I was unduly positive, of course, about a lot of the things that I was suggesting here. Um, partly because if you're going to have lunch, you may as well also have some provocation. Um, 
being unduly positive means that I wasn't giving the example of kids in a playground who all of a sudden become subjected to the laughter or to a great idea that gets laughed down. Um, the, uh, laughter is a very powerful and complicated business. Um, we can laugh in order to form a union with other people. We can also laugh to dismantle things. And, and sometimes in laughing with other people against other people, it can come to be a very nefarious power. So yeah, I think that you're absolutely right. And that distinction is, is, a, really, is a really crucial one. Well, the, so if I could just move on for a minute. Um, one of the things that, that, that crosses uh, my mind when we uh, think about Chomsky and think about the idea of a, a public intellectual um, is the question of the, of the loss of, of public space um, and whether it's really possible to be a public intellectual without there being a public space. I mean, one of the extraordinary things about this, um, you know, this room is you know, you're all free to come here, you know, free to come have a, have a lunch. Um, and in some sense, this is a genuinely public space. Um, but if you think about the, uh, the spaces in which we communicate as a society, mostly they are run by you know, large corporate uh, media mm. and, um, and very, you know, very much controlled uh, spaces. And when we imagine a public space, I mean, I think somehow in my, in my head I, I've still got Athens mm. and the Forum and uh, uh, well, the Rome, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> and and the, the idea of, a, of, a, of, a, of a, you know, an outdoor public space. But what, how is it possible to be a public intellectual these days when there is no, well, the, the idea of the public space has sort of shrunk? Mm. It, it, you know, it's difficult to talk about trends in society, and I think that one must be wary of such notions. But one trend in this society, there's no question about it, is the privatization of space. Um, my parents uh, grew up, uh, uh, or grew into parents, um, as one does, um, owning a store in a shopping center. And it's an unimaginably authoritarian place to work. Uh, you're told what to do what temperature your life is going to be lived at, what music, how many times you have to listen to the same Christmas carols over and over again beginning in October, and so forth and so on. Those are very, very authoritarian spaces um, in which they have their own police and they have their own tax and they have their own laws and they can, you know, you're not allowed to ask for money and you're not allowed to do all sorts of things. You're not allowed to walk around naked as one finds out and so forth. Yeah, um, so, so, and the, the corporatization of space is something that we unfortunately are witnessing uh, constantly in this society and, and more and more um, it's remarkable to notice how few sidewalks there are, it's remarkable to notice how few public benches there are, it's remarkable to notice how illegal it is to be walking around in somewhere other than a public space. Um, so yeah, I, I, I take this very seriously. This is a, a, an unimaginably terrible problem. Um, something that we, ought to, that we ought to think a lot about, I think. Um, but in the, in the Chomsky effect, uh, what I tried to do was I, I cited from very, very free spaces, that is to say blogs and um, internet spaces and so forth, some of the most entertaining, brilliant, salient, powerful, insanely to the point critique is done by people in their basements at 3 o'clock in the morning who can't sleep, who are um, communicating with a bunch of people in South Africa and, and, and uh, Norway and so forth about some subject that they care a whole lot about. So here's a new public space that we can't explore. But I think we've got to worry about becoming isolated in our basements and unable to be on a park bench at 3 o'clock in the morning because then we get arrested and if we're Canadian, we can be deported. <laughs> uh, I want to just ask you a question about truth and then, and then uh, open this up. Um, I, I gave a talk to, to a whole bunch of law students about five years ago, just before we were about to uh, engage in some some kind of military exercise, I forget what it was. Um, and uh, at the end of this, they, they were quite, really quite upset. And one of these uh, students said to me, so what can we do? And I, you know, I'm so dumb, I hadn't even thought of the kind of questions I might be asked. Um, and I just blurted out the first thing I could think of, uh, which was, well, you can just keep telling the truth, um, which I guess is not so far from what you're saying. But you know, in, in the rest of my life as a philosopher, um, I actually talk a lot about uh, the, the, the difficulty of this whole idea of truth. Um, that it, you know, I'm not as we're a complete relativist, but I think the truth is often 
constructed, that it's uh, socially mediated and, and all kinds of things. And, and yet there I was, you know, in my sort of naive way, saying, just, just keep telling the truth. And how, how, do, how do you think about this, this, this kind of, I mean, how does someone like Chomsky think about this mm. question? Because lots of people think they're telling the truth. Mm. Right. And, it's, it's, we've just come out of the most murderous possible uh, century, a century in which people who were apparently telling the truth were telling other people how to live and what to do, and if they didn't live and do as they were told, um, they were in gulags, um, they were murdered, uh, they were uh, pushed outside of power and so forth and so on. You're right, the, the, there is a temptation, and in a lot of these cases it was done by people who were filled with potentially interesting ideas. Um, so what do you do in that phase? Well, I think that you mentioned situation-specific knowledge. I think that one of the points of, of my suggesting today that the role of a public intellectual or the role of an intellectual, if he or she should really have one, should be to catalyze people into thinking for themselves. Um, and that suggests that there is not one truth that's true for everybody. Um, God forbid you agree with me on a lot of things, or that we all agree amongst ourselves on much uh, that, that, that really matters. What we can do is debate and discuss without a sense that, there, that we can arrive at some sort of a, a, a true um, template for how to act. My, a lot of my work, a lot of my Beyond the Ivory Tower work and, and a, a lot of my writing has been about refugee status, re, uh, ref, convention refugees. And I, I became unimaginably boring and stupid as a speaker because I would stand up um, in front at the United Nations High Commission for Refugee Talks and so forth and so on. And I'd say, okay, here's the deal. You cannot possibly adjudicate borders the way that you think you can adjudicate them. You can't possibly tell me who should and should not come in except on the basis of wealth. Right? It's, you, you can't possibly say that this person has suffered and this person hasn't suffered. There's no discourse theory that allows you to do it. There's no uh, God-given rationale that allows you how to do it. The only way to eliminate the problem of convention refugees and to deal with this honestly and fairly is to eliminate national borders. National borders are unbelievably murderous places and unbelievably exclusionary places, and it, it really is the only solution. And anything that you can propose is not going to work. But I would be faced with lawyers and professors and so forth of, of uh, la uh, language theory who would say, no, we're just not trying hard enough. There is a way to figure out if somebody's telling the truth by studying their language. That is just not true. That is not true, or at least I'm, I'm suggesting it's not true. So these people, there, there are many people who believe that there is an answer, and they keep working towards it. Um, in realms where we don't have an answer, I don't know if there are angels dancing on the heads of pins. I don't know that. And I don't know if somebody's telling the truth when they claim to have been uh, raped and brutally tortured uh, in, a, in a country of origin. I don't know, and I can't find out. Um, so that's a a, a, a non-direct answer to a complicated question. Okay. Uh, well, we're going to uh, see what the uh, uh, where the discussion takes us by opening it up, and I'm going to ask Bob just to write down these questions as they come up and uh, answer them all at, at the end. <laughs> you have mentioned the fact that blogs give a way for people to express their opinions. Mm. Is it not true that most everyone who has a blog is trying to be a intellectual and is trying to influence people, and mm. some are successful and have a big following? Mm. I, you know, somebody who stands on a street corner is trying to influence policy, and, and you know. Okay, um, yes, now you're going to answer that. Sorry, question. sorry. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, yeah. This is in question. It has to my blog. Okay. Sorry, no. I'll, 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 I'll stop for a moment. I'll, I'll, I'll obey reporters here. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, is there anything we can do? Yes. Is there anything we can do with our educational system that will help adults learn how to talk to each other and share their truth? Mm -hmm. PhDs, and uh, they can't do that. Mm -hmm. uh, 
that and I don't think our schools train kids how to do it, but they have to be educated. Mm. Yeah. Okay, thank you. There's a question at the back there, uh, behind you. Did you all hear that, the question about uh, Stephen Colbert's use of humor? And John Stewart. And John Stewart, yeah. Thank you. Lady over here. Yes, I was wondering if perhaps you could elaborate on your brushes with authority. <laughs> Exciting. Um, well, I'll, I'll try and because they sort of come together. Yes. Um, I was on a, I was at this time um, here on a visa. Um, I had taught at Yale and now at Vanderbilt, and I had not secured a green card. Um, and uh, it's very problematic and very scary, I must say, to uh, be Canadian and live without uh, status. And I, and I landed up getting one of these driver's things. I can't remember what they're called, the driver's licenses that are not licenses. And I was actually doing interviews in the prison um, because I'm, I'm finishing up a research report right now for the Tennessee Department of Corrections on immigrant incarceration. And I walked in to do interviews with these people who had been arrested for immigration violations and maybe something else. <laughs> and they said, you're only allowed to bring one thing with you. So the only thing I'm, you're allowed to bring with you is a driver's license and one key. So I brought the key to my motorcycle and my driver's thing, certificate. And I presented it to them at the front so I could get into the maximum security area. And they wouldn't let me in because it says not valid for identification purposes. So here is a professor at Vanderbilt who couldn't get in to do the interviews with immigrants because, anyway, it was absolutely fantastic. But then, um, <laughs> after having, it's, it's an unbelievably sad area of discussion. I, it just, I, I don't even want to tell you how sad this report is and how horrendous what is happening to uh, uh, undocumented people are, are, are in this country. But afterwards, after finally getting let in by an exception, and you notice it's always, there's always the exception in these things, right? I got in by an exception, did the interview, and then drove off into the night unimaginably scared and unhappy and terrified of, of, of the future of all of us. Um, and I went into a bar um, uh, at the end to have a little drinky winky on the house. And I thought, if I sit down here, I'll be able to you know, reconstruct my thoughts. And the guy says, do you have any ID? <laughs> <laughs> <It's a weird> <laughs> And I said, thank you so much. You know, I, I, I can't, A, I'm, you know, I, I am 17. I couldn't be happier that, that, I, that I look it. Um, 
I gave him my ID, and of course, he, he wouldn't serve me a drink. And I, and I said, wait a second, in the motorcycle, I kept my old expired driver's license, the one that used to be a driver's license before they passed this new driver's certificate law. So I brought it in, and I said, oh, here, here it is. He says, I'm sorry, I can't take this expired. So, um, <laughs> so if you want to take me out for a drink, I'm still dying uh, at this point. This was months ago. Um, so what is it like um, to be, uh, so this relates to some of the immigration stuff. It's, it's um, God help us if we are subjected to some of the um, inquisitions and hurdles as normal, uh, ordinary citizens that uh, non-citizens are uh, forced to go through every day. Uh, you go and visit your friend in prison and they ask you for your ID and you don't have proper ID and then before you know it, you'll end up in prison. It's, it's unbelievably sad. So what can humor do about that? Um, and what does it mean to be an outsider in a society? Um, you know, uh, just, just giving some of these stories is, is uh, en enough to make you want to laugh and cry. And uh, I think that they're, those two are related. Um, how can we educate people about this, including our uh, students? I must tell you that I am astonished at some of the things that my students tell me about what they've been told in classes. Uh, not just about specific facts, which are whatever they are, but on how to write and what to do. And I've come to the conclusion, I actually have a chapter in here about education. Um, I've come to the conclusion um, that what we're basically being taught in school is how to obey authority. Um, and the better you are at it, the more you're going to succeed. Uh, if you wear a belt and you wear proper clothing and you come in on time and you're deferential and you don't speak out of turn, and you hand your paper in on time and it's not done with blueberry ink or uh, has smudges on it and so forth and so on, you're going to do all right. Um, <clears throat> that's a lousy thing to be teaching people, uh, it seems to me. Uh, not disobedience of authority for its own sake, but learning how to think uh, and express your thoughts is, is certainly not something that's being um, enforced in a situation of such powerful authority. People are also being taught, and this absolutely astonishes me, how to write. <clears throat> By people are telling them things like, a paragraph has three sentences. <laughs> a sentence has 12 words or less, or eight words or less. Um, this is unimaginable. This is phenomenal. So what I've actually started doing in my courses is I say to students, I don't want you to write me a paper. God help me, I don't want a paper. Write me a letter. <laughs> pretend I'm your mother. If you really want to laugh, pretend I'm your mother. Um, <laughs> pretend I'm, I'm a friend that is away from university and tell me about what you thought about this book in a letter then I get something that's useful. If somebody writes me a paper, it's unbelievable. Um, so what can we do in an educational structure? We can break down this notion that what we need to do is learn to be obedient. Uh, we can learn that expressing oneself in, uh, oneself in creative and powerful ways, that's all children do, as we know, is a virtue and not something to be beaten out of people, um, in my opinion. Um, the late night John Stewart, uh, Stephen Colbert, and I, I might also add this guy Cohen, um, the, the film uh, the, with the Kazakhstan. Oh. Yeah, you know. I, <laughs> Borat. Yeah. This is some of the most powerful um, stuff imaginable. And as you know, um, people, people's the looks in their eyes and the way that they move their forehead and so forth and so on, as Stewart is so good at. That type of stuff, I think, is, is, is very, very good. And I think that one of the things that something like Stuart does quite well is he just repeats uh, that which is already out there, uh, but repeats it um, with effect. And the effect is you kind of think about it in a different context, and you say, that's true. That is completely insane. Uh, I, I, that is completely and totally insane. I can't believe I bought that. Uh, that is completely outrageous. Uh, I can't believe my f I'm, I'm, I'm uh, cutting uh, taxes and supporting this and so forth and so on. Um, so, yeah, um, it, it's, a, it's a powerful tool. I'm glad that kids are inspired by that stuff. I think it's, it's, it's cool stuff. Um, but, you know, as you also know, um, you can have really fun conversations like this in bars uh, or in, in public spaces of all sorts. Uh, another person I worked with who I adore um, is this guy named Marc Angenot. And I actually did a special collection of him, uh, uh, on him, which is online, um, called Marc Angenot and the Scandal of History. And one of the things that he claims is that not only should we differ not differentiate between people on the basis of credentials, but we ought to be careful about texts as well. And that in fact there is something called social discourse. And that, the, and that a powerful uh, medium of the display of ideas is just in the prevalent social discourse. Novelists seldom invent anything, as you know. 
they pick up on elements in the social discourse and they put them together and they happen to get it published and sometimes it's unbelievably funny and brilliant. But all this speaks to what it's like to be out late at night and just paying attention to what you're hearing and just and 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 w keeping that laughter and, and being sort of James Joycean about it and just frequenting all sorts of people and realizing that the world is unimaginably rich and complex and beautiful and that the truths, the so-called truths with a capital T that are apparently being beaten into our students and so forth are not in the form of ten uh, word sentences and three sentence paragraphs but may be in these sparkling encounters uh, which we ought to um, promote, I think. Um, <clears throat> the Columbia University introduction, I th maybe in some ways it was a tribute to free speech on both sides. Um, we ought definitely to bring uh, people with unpopular opinions in. There, that's clear, uh, it seems to me. Um, there's another chapter in here. I'm sorry, I, I spent 10 damn years writing this thing. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, I, 10 years, you know. I just, uh, and you know, there, it, it's all, it's unimaginable to have the, the thing out. You know, it's, it's there and I can, I can like, you know, uh, hold it. <laughs> um, but it might not have come out. That sort of gets back to that question of, you know, what about uh, um, people on street corners or, or, or people with blogs trying to get, get attention. This could easily have landed up stuck in my computer forever, right, easily. Um, and lots of people's brilliant writers do, writings do land up stuck in their computers or on the back of menus or whatever else forever. To happen to have a forum for it is unimaginably exciting. But one of the chapters in here is, is about people who hate Chomsky. They just hate him. They, 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 they really think of him as a traitor and a, and a, and a betrayer of truth and all, an anti-Semite and anti-Israel and all sorts of other stuff. And one of the reasons why they think that is because he supported this guy named Robert Faurisson and his right to um, question the Holocaust. Now, of course, this is a very topical issue, particularly as, as regards, for example, this Iranian uh, president who also um, does the same thing. And Chomsky signed a petition saying that um, people have the right to do research on whatever they want, right, or, or, or should, and then let it go into the discourse marketplace and, be, and work out there, as opposed to saying, you're not allowed to deny the Holocaust. That's it. If you deny the Holocaust, you're going to jail. Right? So for him, that was an illegitimate thing. So he signed a petition. By signing that petition, he landed up, um, the, 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 the petition landed up being called Chomsky's petition, which it wasn't. And then uh, Faurisson, uh, a, a, his publisher, wrote, wrote to Chomsky and said, can you justify your having supported his right to free speech? And Chomsky wrote a 10-page letter. He likes to write long letters to explain it. And it was put, without Chomsky's permission, in, as a preface into Faurisson's book. So now all of a sudden, Chomsky became linked to this guy in a way that was totally wrong and appropriate. That's been a very successful way of pushing Chomsky outside of the mainstream. And people, therefore, think he's anti-Semitic and uh, denies the Holocaust and so forth and so on. So that's a, a, a very complicated business. How does that relate to the thing at Columbia? I think that we're right to, have, to, to bring the, the people like this in. Um, the Columbia president um, who gave that very inflammatory introduction. In some ways, he was exercising his right to free speech as well. Um, so I, I'm not so sure that I have an answer. I'm not so sure I would have done it exactly in that same way myself. Um, he may have been protecting himself or, or his constituents or whatever else by doing it in that way. It's a, it's a complicated business. But I'll tell you something. It's a lot easier to hear what you want to hear than what you don't want to hear. No question about that. Um, and we ought to support um, efforts made to promote that which we don't want to hear. It doesn't mean you have to agree with it, uh, but it's awfully good to hear it. Um, so censorship of all, of all sorts is a dubious activity. Yeah, um, there's a question you're avoiding, and that's a question about you being a Canadian. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and what impact that has. Yeah, well, one of the impacts is I love this weather because I'm still frozen from having grown up in the tundra. Uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm actually not a Canadian. I'm, I'm from Montreal. Uh, <laughs> uh, and, uh, and it's, it, it's, it, it is another planet, uh, as you probably know. Quebec is another planet, and Montreal is another planet inside of that planet. And it, it's, um, I think, you know, retrospectively in particular, um, fascinating to have grown up uh, in Quebec. My family were, uh, was immigrants. And in 1976, uh, the Quebec government uh, changed to the Parti Québécois, who took power on a nationalist platform. And they were going to apparently do things like nationalize banks, uh, and so forth and so on. So and, and at, at the age of 15, I lost every single friend I had. Every single Anglophone friend I had moved 
to Toronto or to the States. So I and my parents, who were too poor to move, uh, um, stayed. And, and they're still there, by the way. And we went through this unimaginable uh, recession and, and so forth and so on. Um, and, and I think that this marked me in some ways, partly because you, well, I mean, it was a good thing I fetishized francophone um, uh, people of, of various sexes and so forth. Because it, it, it was good because I, I, I certainly developed my understanding of French culture uh, and francophone culture. Um, I had been educated in an anglophone uh, place where you learned French, mais on parlait comme ça, quoi. Oh, c'était un endroit où on parlait comme ça. And then you go outside, and they say, mais je comprends pas, là, je te parle quoi, là. Je comprends rien. But because you know, I was in an Anglo society, there was a sense that you had to teach sort of highbrow French stuff. So I read Jean-Paul Sartre and Simone de Beauvoir, and I never read any of the Quebec authors, which was fascinating. What it basically meant was that I was in a ghetto, and I was destined to stay in that ghetto forever which was called the Anglo ghetto, even speaking French. Because if you walk into a bar in Quebec and you say, bon, alors voilà, est-ce que je peux avoir une bière, s'il vous plaît? They'll, they won't know what you're talking about. You know, they just, or they certainly won't answer you. So um, <laughs> that, that's, that has certainly had an effect. And it's had, <laughs> it's had, yeah, you need to have ID. <laughs> it's had an effect also because Quebec is a very, um, Quebec valorizes criminality, I think. Quebec is, stands outside of the norms of ordinary society because it's a Latin society, because it stays awake very late, because it's very lax about laws, because and so forth and so on. Um, so it's been interesting for me to move to the States, uh, subsequent to having grown up in Quebec, um, where you don't fear authority very much and where we don't have an army and, and that sort of thing. It, it, it's, it's been a very um, interesting. And it's also interesting for me because um, my parents get, kept getting these fines um, because they owned a store which sold art supplies. And after 1976, it was illegal to have English signs in a store, if you can imagine. Um, you ha everything had to be in French. So we would buy these uh, paintbrushes from Grumbacher. Um, I say we because we all started working there when we were like four months old. Uh, and, and the Grumbacher displays were very expensive. You had to buy them, right? Corporate world. You have to buy the stupid display, which costs $800, and the brushes only cost you know, 90 so you, you buy the display, and it's got lovely descriptions of how to paint and how to mix colors and, you know, useful things. And they would leave them in the store. And then the language police would come, and they would get a fine, which, of course, they couldn't afford. And then, you know, the shopping center would add another fine, and then they'd play Christmas music louder, and you'd feel like shooting yourself four or five times a day. And it was un unbelievably terrible. Um, so so that, that experience was, was, you know, very marking to have the language police walking around and such. At the same time, though, uh, Quebec's an unbelievably delightful place to be. It's very cool to speak French. Like, it's, 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 it's a lot of fun. But now, I'm, I'm here in the States where there are no language laws except you're not allowed to speak other languages, which is fascinating. <laughs> um, and, and when you call Sprint, or when you call uh, whoever you call, um, if you can afford to call Sprint, uh, th th there's an option to speak in Spanish. And that's not, you know, the government of Tennessee does not say, okay, that's it. From now on, Sprint, you have to start speaking Spanish. Is that, how, you know. Or if you go to the airport in Detroit, they also speak, um, as you know, four or five languages, including Japanese. Um, uh, uh, so th that, that means that there is something in the marketplace that encourages a certain amount of language speaking without the power from above. Um, so that's been, it, it's, it's shaped in some ways my thinking about um, some of, the, some of the, these terrible questions that face um, immigrant populations every day here. How to assimilate, what it means to drive down Nolensville Road and have um, Spanish signs and so forth and so on. It's, it's quite fascinating. It's time we thanked our speaker. And uh, let me tell you... There's more where that came from. You want to, you want to hear, um, <laughs> hear, hear Bob uh, next, uh, a week tomorrow uh, at 4.30 in the law school at Vanderbilt. He's um, giving a, a public lecture, which you're all welcome to, to come to. Uh, that's a week tomorrow. That's Thursday, the 11th of October at 4.30. Thank and you so much for having me.